All right, we're live. We're here. All right, I'm here with Michelle Flemons. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Hi. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Not bad at all. How are you? I'm doing great. I, we had a little time mix up, so I was in a mid workout, and I'm a little sweaty right now. I'm a little like flustered, but it's all right. We're gonna get it. It's my fault. I made the conversion error wrong. Um, but super excited to talk to you because I think uh, we were just chatting before we recorded that. You have so much expertise from an academic point of view, but you also have a very long history in gymnastics. And I think the concepts that you're studying related to culture change and, you know, the way we've always done it and how we change people, like our belief systems, I think it's so important. It's so relevant right now, especially with Athlete A, with Gymnastics Alliance, with what we see is change happening at a blistering rate. I think that this is a really good conversation for everyday people in the trenches who are like, I just need help. I just need people won't change. I can't, I'm, I feel stuck in a rut. People are really frustrated right now. So, um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you, but can you quickly, um, just give a little bit of an intro of kind of your background in gymnastics and where you got into academia and the, and the university you're working with in, in your PhD work. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, I started out, my dad was in the Navy, so we moved around a lot. Um, and at one point, so when I was about 11, 10, 11, we went over to Hong Kong. Um, and I was really, really lucky over there that I trained with the Hong Kong national squad. So I was training sort of 25 hours a week at elite level. Um, and then when we came back over to the U UK after a couple of years, um, didn't compete as highly in the UK, um, partly political, but partly because I was one of those gymnasts that was an incredible hard worker, but not necessarily the most talented. So um, it's just is what it is. It's fine. Um, and I was, yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I went from spending years doing, you know, do, training, competing and so on, um, and then became a coach. Um, and that was inspired very much by the coaches that I worked with um, or who worked with me. Um, and we'd had a, I'd had a mixture, you know, there was the good, the bad and the ugly. And it was the good ones that made me want to carry on with gym. I think if it's in your blood, it's in your blood. It doesn't just go away. I get ex I still get excited at the smell of the gym when I walk in. <laughs> it's never going to go away. Um, but at one point then, um, moving swiftly on, um, I needed an actual what my mum would probably call an actual real job. Um, so I trained as a PE teacher um, and I spent a few years teaching PE in mainstream secondary school. Um, and then the opportunity came up to do some lecturing around um, teaching gymnastics and teaching gymnastics in schools. So I started with that and then ended up at University of Bedfordshire uh, working on teacher education training programs, uh, working with master's students and so on. And alongside that, I met my first PhD supervisor, which was David Kirk. Um, and he, um, he, said you know come do your ph come do a phd so that's what i did and it was originally focused around um it's basically called occupational socialization and the subjective warrant of physical education teachers which to most people sounds a bit blair wow. um, but ultimately <laughs> it's just about teacher beliefs and how they impact on practice mm. but where my um where my sort of my I suppose where my heart lies, it's in the gymnastics. Mm. So everything I've learned relates back into back into that and coaching and everybody's coaching story. So effectively we're socialized into how we teach or how we deliver, you know, how we coach, what we do. And that's usually dependent on our own personal experiences in sports. So if we we're a gymnast ourselves, mm. um, a lot of the practices that we um, that we experienced, if they worked for us, then we'll probably emulate them when we become coaches ourselves. Um, also, but there's sometimes that can include the not so great practices as well and how we interact with children, particularly at elite level. And I think with gymnastics being such an early specialist sport, we are dealing with children and not adults. And it's really easy to forget that they're not little mini adults they're actually little children at a certain developmental level and we've got to remember that when we're teaching them and as they grow and all the all the things around body you know sort of body image and how they feel about themselves what we do in the gym for 25 30 hours a week you know can actually have such a huge impact on them so that's why it's so important now that we kind of examine and reflect on how we interact with our children and how we behave um and what we say to them because actually the wider picture is what happens outside of the gym so yeah, absolutely i don't know anybody watching i just grabbed my i just grabbed my notebook and i was like i need to uh, start writing things down very quickly because i'm going to have a lot of things to have positive notes from super excited to talk to you um yeah let me um let me just share a piece of your email that you sent me when we first kind of connected because i think it'll give people a really good uh idea about why i jumped so quick at the opportunity to talk to you and then i guess pose a question to you follow up at it so you said 
So coach socialization and beliefs can impact practice. Our beliefs act as filters to new knowledge. For example, if we're taught one way of doing things and we firmly believe this is the best way to do it, then we filter out new knowledge due to the power group of habitus, the things that we do without thinking, these new ideas can be washed out. This is called adopting a pedagogy of necessity. They don't want to upset or challenge the status quo, or they don't want to be able, or they just want to be able to fit into their gym club. And like that, I can't tell you how much of like a firework went off in my brain when I had, because of the emails that I get from a lot of people around the world. And I'm super grateful now that like the podcast reaches international, all levels, all ages. So it's not just an elite gymnastics thing. And I really want to say that's important from the beginning. It's not just about yeah. apples and elite, right? But what that means for me is people always say like, I know we need to change. I'm a little frustrated in my gym. The coaches, the parents, the athletes, whoever, my other, my other coworkers just won't hear new ideas. They won't change. We've tried so hard to have meetings and go to courses and talk about it. But really what it comes down to is we talk about it and then nothing changes. Nothing happens. It's the same old, like I say, the seven most dangerous words are that's the way we've always done it. It's the same thing. Just passed down. People are scared, in my opinion. People are scared of rocking the boat and the status quo. Like you said, their fear of unknown is very real. And the fear of social judgment is super hardcore. They don't want social rejection because they come new ideas or they're against the grain or like they're making things harder. You know what I mean? And so I, I hear desperately from people across the whole world that like people, I really want change or a few people want change, but like my gym owner or my coach or my, the parent group or the athletes won't change. And so that's my, my question to you is, what makes this so challenging for our sport to just try something new? Like we're so stubborn. It's the most stubborn sport I've ever seen. Like, what do you think is attached to that? Maybe from your personal point of view or from what, like the research that you've done, like, what are you, what are your thoughts on all that? Um, I think we're so attached to it. So if we look at the research, we talked very, you talked very briefly there about um, beliefs and how they impact on your practice. So effectively, mm -hmm. we have our beliefs and they are ingrained in us in the first stage. So if we look at oc occupational socialization, big term, and we break it down, there are three phases. OK, so the first one is the anticipatory phase. And that's our time as a gymnast or watching other coaches or whatever. So that time is when our beliefs, particularly when we're so young, that's when our beliefs start to really form and they become part of our core. Mm. So they are really, really hard to change. Now, when we start doing coaching courses, they're fantastic. They'll probably be bells and whistles and loads of really, really great new ideas. And you think, yeah, 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 I'm going to do that. I'll try that. Or alternatively, it'll be, mm, I don't, we don't do it that way. Actually, yeah, I'll listen, I'll nod, I'll say whatever, and then I'm going to move swiftly on and go back to the way that I know works. So the proof is in the pudding. We're producing gymnasts, we're producing champions, whatever. So actually, if it's that, it's that whole notion that if it is, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So mm. why would you try, why would you change? If you're comfortable with that, then you're going to stick with that. And that also goes with a power thing as well that. If you if you've got if you're somebody in power, it's really hard to kind of turn around and say, I might have got that wrong because mm. actually you're you're becoming vulnerable and that almost tips the balance to where you are and you are the not you know, you are the font of all knowledge. Then if somebody else comes in and says, Actually, it's not done that way, mm. you're you're having to question that. So it's about people, one, being open and actually challenging their own and reflecting on their own practices and saying, well, how effective is my practice? How am I, how is that actually impacting on my children today? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, I, in my own personal experience, I could walk into the gym and I remember very much when I was a lot younger, um, I would go in and I say, no, come on, you've just got to do it. Get on with it. It'll be fine. Just do it. We trust you. I trust you to do it. And I think that I was saying all the right things. And then I realized that when I switched the way that I spoke to the gymnasts and I changed the way that I spoke to them. So I'd say, do you know, what? I love what you did there. You know, you, your legs were beautiful in that. Now what I need to see is X or mm. it's okay if you can't do it today. It's not a problem. Let's move on. Okay. And we'll come back to it because this has got to come from you. So the onus then becomes on is on the child or the gymnast to actually have that autonomy about decision making about what happens to their bodies and most of them are there because they really want to be so it's actually that's you know it's changing the way you speak and it's changing the way you interact with those children and you realize that you can actually still get the same result if not stronger because the motivation is coming from them instead of from you mm. um, so that's kind of the two there um but sort of we said about the anticipatory phase and the beliefs, the next stage on from that is um, the professional phase. So that's when you're doing that coaching course. Mm. And 
unless it's really proven that if you go off and do something and then you go back into your gym, you will revert. This is habit. These are things we do, the blindly actioning functions of self-control. We do that without even thinking. So actually, it's really hard to change what you do without thinking. You know, we eat with a knife and fork a certain way. It's the same difference. You know, you'll coach a certain way. When someone can't do it, you'll automatically put your hand in and support to do it. You know, come on, you can do that. Mm. And actually, then they're having the confidence in you to do it for them because your hand's in their back, even though they don't need it. You're not actually going on to the motivation side mm. and the confidence side and building that mental element of them so that they can do it for themselves. So then then I think that's where co coaches can become frustrated. Well, well, why can't you do it? You just need to get on with it. And that's that horrible shift between supporting and being coach and coaching and actually becoming abusive because then you're going on the ego into orientated I need you to do this but who do you need them to do it for is it for themselves or is it for them so again sorry I keep going off in all different directions but no, ultimately <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately it's um it's thinking about that child holistically and shifting that balance that they're not just a physical machine that are doing things they're actually this holistic whole person mm. and every time every time we walk into the gym as coaches that's how we need to see them that they're children a whole child that has a whole life outside of gym and if they've had something go on at school that day and they walk into the gym and it's been a really pants day you know they might not feel like doing that really scary thing that they had to do that they maybe started that worried them a little bit because yep. they're not there in the head or they go the other way where they're like actually yeah bring it on today you know I've had a great day and everything's good and I'm going to go for it yep. so you know it's dealing with these little people but then in our own practice then when we're going into the gym that's where our organizational phase is when we're part of the organization we will recycle the old ideals because they are part of that habitus mm. and habitus being that those things we do without thinking the things that the person that's in charge of you says yeah that's how i do it that's why you fit into that gym so that fear of not fitting in is horrible you know you don't not want to especially if you love it and you're passionate about it you know i've worked in some places where i was like square peg round hole and mm -hmm. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. And then you think, oh, well, is it me? Is it me that's wrong? When in actual fact, it wasn't necessarily me that was wrong. It was me that just did it differently. And I think it's embracing that difference and saying it's OK to do it differently. Hmm. But change doesn't happen overnight. You know, you've got to do it gradually. So it might just be actually starting with the way that you speak to somebody. You know, the coaching techniques themselves may stay the same. Um, so, you know, they tend to be pretty standard. You know, we progress we're very progressive and m the majority of coaches are very progressive and very safe what we're talking about here is more the interactions and those are the bits that are really important because actually as a coach you are already training the next generation of coaches by being a coach mm. so that's why it's so important that we try and get this we try and get this right so mm -hmm. Yeah, so change, it's slow and it's steady and it's starting with the small things. And I think also we go on coaches, but we don't actually, we go on courses, but we don't actually follow up. So mm. there's, um, so research wise, there's um, uh, two guys, um, Lave and Wenger, and they talk about communities of practice. And actually the community of practice is a really good way of promoting change. So you may pick up one idea and say, right, okay, we're going to have a go at this. But mm. actually, you know that there's other clubs in your area or there's other coaches that are working with that it can just be a group on Facebook how did that go for you did it work no this didn't work did you try this so you can actually share ideas and support the change rather than just go in oh didn't work I'll leave it I'll go back to my old way of doing it because it's easier yep. so, yeah, yeah. It's amazing <laughs> I, really, I really talk with podcast guests that I don't say anything I just I'm like this is awesome I'm just learning it's like a free lecture for me this is amazing I'm oh, sorry <laughs> I love you start sneezing. I'll be mm -hmm. like no, <laughs> I'm all about it. I'm all about it. So yeah, I have 47 follow-up questions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> after the, I, I think the thing that really resonates with me is I, I, I believe, or I feel as though it really does come back to uh, someone's personal belief system. Like I think that change is multi-layered, right? We have like so many areas that people, and this is a problem that I see. I made this mistake. And I also see this in our community across the world is the national bodies are, are putting the blame on the individual coaches. The individual coaches are saying it's the parents. The parents are saying it's the coaches. The kids are saying, no, it's my coach. No, you know, it's like just everybody is just pointing fingers across the aisle at the different parties we have when in reality, everybody has a role to play. And I think it does. I, I truly believe that there are systematic changes that need to occur. But 
on a on a real tactical level, you changing your own personal belief system again, uh, being open minded or trying something new, or you know, I don't like the way this feels or something like that. I really do believe that catalyst comes from an individual changing their own daily behaviors. I'm not even talking about gymnastics. I'm talking about like, what do you value? What do you do every day to take care of yourself? So you're a positive role model. Do you make the decision to sleep a little bit more and maybe eat a little bit better and fuel yourself so that you're a positive example and you have energy in the practice and you're not dragging your personal life drama into the gym, into the coaching situation and, and letting that out on some of your coworkers, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I'm curious about where do you were saying these beliefs are so important, but is it someone's like beliefs about their sense of self-worth and their sense of value that is, is important? Is it someone's metric of success, what their beliefs are and what successful gymnastics is? Is it uh, that like their relationship with uh, emotional discomfort, I think is very important. Like someone's ability to have, I think physical uh, discomfort is something gymnasts learn, but I think emotional distress and dealing with negative emotions, like maybe some fear of rejection, I think is extremely high. Like you said, when someone doesn't want to get pushed out of their circle in their gym or they don't want to be different, it's like, it's like being a kid all over again in grade school, right? You want to fit in, you want to have friends, you want to have connection and community. So do these beliefs come more from like fears and things and insecurities, or they come more from the success metrics of what you're trying to achieve? I guess, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if I'm framing my question well, but where do you think those no, are? No, you're framing it really well. I think I think it personally, and I think also listening, sort of looking at the research, and bearing in mind this is research based around physical education teachers, mm. they will adopt a pedagogy of necessity in their placement or the organizational phase. So when they go into their schools, they can learn all this amazing stuff on their teaching courses, for example. It's the same with coaches and coaching courses. They will then, they really want to be able to fit in and it is about their self-worth, how they feel about themselves, um, that need to fit in and that need to want to be able to progress themselves. So by having that, um, they know that sometimes they have to change their own, they, they may go against their own beliefs in order to do that. Um, so I think that's where it becomes very strongly. So when I did my PhD study, um, I interviewed some newly qualified teachers and they were saying the same. So it does link into coaching as well. Uh, bear with me. Yeah. But with them, it's the same, it's the same sort of, it's the same principle really. They would go in and they would be like, oh, I really wanted to try this, but my mentor said that that wasn't the way to do it. And I had to go and speak to this person. So actually they end up jumping through hoops and pleasing the mentor rather than actually doing it their own way. And mm -hmm. it almost then if they don't have opportunity to explore different ways of doing things and they're just doing it the way that the mentor tells them to, they're not getting that space to be able to reflect effectively to say, actually, I know that I should be doing it this way, but my mentor says I have to do it this way. I'm not going to pass and I'm not going to move on unless I do it the way that they tell me to, because they say it's the way of doing it. So that's where they need, that's where we need the strength. So actually it's about reflecting effectively as well. So the mentors need to be trained to be able to reflect with the people that they're working with, because actually it's our new blood, our new generation of coaches that have some amazing ideas and some amazing things. They've got a wonderful voice, but how often do we turn that voice up loud enough for, for them to be heard? Um, because obviously they lack experience, so what would they know? And I think the ones that the gym clubs that move forward, and the you know the schools, the departments that move forward and change their practice, they're the ones that are actually listening and giving everybody an equal voice. Mm -hmm. So it's about the people that are in charge need to really listen to what everyone else is saying uh, really carefully um, because it will be the one, the quiet one in the corner that's just cracking on that probably has some really amazing ideas that you're missing out on because you're too busy listening to your own voice. And I think I've probably been guilty of that, to be fair. I can talk for England. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. And I think it's it's so interesting because I, I've read a lot of research from Google and from um, the Navy SEALs over here is like the most elite military unit. And then um, also it was in the highest performing professional sports teams, different studies that when you have new new blood, as you say, and people who are involved, the highest performing teams, they have psychological safety is one of the most common traits they have. They have an emotional safety net where they're they're not judged when they give new ideas. And it's really just like open field day to say whatever you think and let's just brainstorm. And it's not like I think what commonly happens is somebody brings up a new idea and people are like, yeah, all right, whatever. Like I, that's, that's stupid. Why would you ever think of that? Like, no, there's no way we can do that. I think that that quickly squashes the creativity, 
creativity and the cohesion in a group. And so that's what Google found is the highest performing teams of six to 10 people. I think it was, was like the magic number um, as those people who felt comfortable speaking up about new ideas and voicing conflict. And, you know, when they spoke up against someone's behavior or something they were concerned with, it wasn't seen as an attack. It wasn't seen as um, a personal insult to the, to the person. And, you know, instead of it being, it's more just, how do we get the best of everybody in, in the best of what we have towards our goal? And the, the, what's popping into my mind is when you have a gym club with, I know, one really high level senior national or junior elite, very high level coach and a bunch of other coaches working alongside them. People feel very scared to speak up if they see something that's concerning and, and against that because like, oh, well, they're the they're the, the, the gym club head or they're the lead coach and I don't want to get fired. I don't want to be like ousted. I don't want to get pushed to the side. I don't want gossip behind my back. And so it squashes all of the creativity and it squashes, in my opinion, the need to call out inappropriate behaviors or just have someone who feels comfortable speaking up for new ideas. I think that's how professional disagreement happens. And I think I see a lot of that as people who are unfortunately scared to do that because like you said, they go into this environment and now it's kind of like the weight of it's heavy. So I guess back to the question I have is, is so I'm, I talked about individual and then NGB level. That's a big gap between the, the space there. So do you feel this change must happen more in the gym club level where like leaders, gym owners, or like head optional coaches, head compulsory coaches, head rec departments, is that who we need to try to make sure we affect? Because if they're more open-minded and they take criticism well and change and actually practically put in new things to change once you have a meeting, is, does that inspire people who are below them or are, I don't want to say below, around them to um, to feel comfortable with more change being spoken about? Is that true or am I wrong there? Yeah, I th no, I think you're right there. Absolutely. And I think that needs to come from above that actually we are all human and mm. we make mistakes and if someone said to me michelle you got that you know i really didn't like the way you did that and sometimes you know in yourself that i'm going was i a bit sharp with that kid there yeah you were a bit sharp you maybe needed to and that's the i'm lucky that where i work at the moment we get we have that so i know in myself if i don't feel like i've addressed something as well as i could have done and it's that ability to reflect and i also think that if you have as somebody who really is on that power trip that you know, it doesn't matter what you do and it doesn't matter how it's working. That's where at the national governing body level, there needs to be whistleblowing outside of the actual, out of the organization itself. So it's completely separate and it's investigated separate because it's all these power relationships that cause the issues. So actually, if you've got something that's absolutely completely independent, where whether it's parents that could go or it's children that can go, more importantly, it's the voice of the children mm -hmm. because they're the ones that know how they feel when they walk in the gym. So regardless of how powerful that person is, this is where that that is their abuse of power when they're behaving that way. So actually, if we've then got an abuse, whether they recognize it or not, they need someone else to kind of say, that's completely unacceptable and it's not mm -hmm. okay to behave that way. So we're now dipping into, rather than sort of the low level change, we're talking about massive change where somebody has not behaved appropriately or they've, you know, like the athlete A and they're not calling it out. How many people, you know, if everybody ignores what's going on, then, and these children that if you think about their, their bodies and, how they feel about themselves gymnasts are used to being handled you know that's quite normal for them to have people touching them because that's what happens you know they're being supported a lot they you know that's that becomes so there's almost that la extra layer that makes them all the more vulnerable than maybe a runner who you know running around the track or whatever nobody touches them you mm. know nobody needs to unless it's physio or whatever but that that normalized that almost normalized behavior combined with trust is is just an accident waiting to happen which is why we need to make sure that the people that are in charge are the right people in charge and if they're not then mm. parents gymnasts other coaches need to have something completely independent to go to where if there needs to be an investigation there can be um, and it can be just sitting and listening in. I mean, in the UK, in schools, we have Ofsted. Everybody hates Ofsted. You know, they come in, they check in, and they see what's going on in the schools. You know, we have um, walkthroughs. Why are safeguarding officers not doing that? You know, why are they not just having drop-in visits to see what the feel of the gym is like, to see how it's going on? You know, that kind of role is so important. And it's not just a case of sifting through the paperwork and looking at, 
looking at evidence. You know, it's more than that. You know, when you walk into a gym, whether you're walking into a really warm, safe place or whether you're not, you can see straight away, you can feel it. And I think I know that you can't evidence isn't strong enough on feeling, but it would certainly give a little bit more in terms of something doesn't sit right here. Why are those kids so quiet or why are those children behaving in that particular way? Children can't just put it on like that. You mm -hmm. know, they're probably the most honest. You see them and you can you get a feel for how they feel about how they're being treated. So you know i think and people don't change you know people can switch it up maybe once or twice um but if they're suddenly doing something different to what they would normally do every day those kids know that they're doing something different every day and it's a simple question did your coach always do this or is this a new thing do you know what i mean oh no it's new today you know <laughs> so they would and particularly younger ones they they wouldn't think twice about about that it's not about putting on that show or that performance i think the the scales soon come down they soon fall down um when something isn't genuine and i think it's that genuine authentic behavior and seeing children progress well and feel good about themselves um is going to make that difference does that answer the question or did i waffle off a bit there <laughs> amazing it's perfect and i again i have a lot of follow-up uh, thoughts and questions which are hopefully Gonna help this as well but yeah i think um i'm just i'm reflecting back first of all the one thing that's always really heartbreaking to me and honestly one of the bigger reasons why i continue to do so much work with shift and stuff like that is like it's, it's such a shame that it takes tragedy to change things you know what i mean it takes like a massive emotional catalyst like something like athlete a in the scandal and like all these people like it really breaks my heart to think about how much unnecessary suffering is happening in gymnastics because of these things we're talking about, whether it's a lack of education, a lack of systems to make sure we're holding people accountable by a moral and ethical code, um, people feeling that they're, they need to tie themselves and their self-worth towards external things, which is what I'm going to talk about next. But um, it's just, it's so awful that like gymnastics is hard. It's this challenging, it's uncomfortable. It's already really, really bad as it is, but like there's so much unnecessary suffering that I feel like could go away or could be mitigated if we entertain some of the ideas that we're talking about here. And I, I really hope people pause and take that to heart because it shouldn't take a bunch of gymnasts in your gym getting back fractures for you to realize that maybe you're doing too much or maybe you need to think about doing something when they're younger that's different. It shouldn't take eight gym, eight uh, people leaving your gym on your coaching staff to be like, wow, maybe I'm not the greatest leader that I could be. You know what I mean? It shouldn't take that. And it's a shame that it takes that. But that being said, I don't know, I'll use myself and, and put myself in the hot seat here is like being very, very open and kind of honest about this here is, is my problems. And I think what people resonate with the most is I really tied my sense of self-worth as a coach and as a human to my job and, and to my work, you know? So I was, you know, my level of happiness, my my perceived value of self-worth was if my kids were getting new skills, hitting routines, scoring yeah. well at meets, um, if they were winning, right? Like all these kind of things. Also, like I was addicted to everybody else's praise and the people's compliments of me because I was insecure and I was fearful. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was so fearful and I was so insecure about you know, it's just social rejection. I didn't want people to not want to like me. I wanted everyone to like me and, and, and be around me because I'm just a social guy. But also too is like, I didn't want to miss out on opportunities for myself and my kids. So I was doing all these things because I was, I was, I was scared. I was scared of the unknown and I was scared of social rejection. And I just been through a lot where like, you know, it hurts, it hurts to be on the outside and kind of not have that. So like as a coach, that's why I made the, I tied myself worth to external things. And that's what I found is that that's where my ego got tripped. Cause when people would tell me like, I don't know if that's, okay and i'm like you know what do you know you know i'm a doctor i yeah, yeah. like all this crap and um it really took painful conversations with some of my close friends and the gymnasts that i coach to be like we don't want to be around you we don't like you you're not fun yeah. to be around because you're yeah. so hardcore and like regret is one of the most heavy emotional catalysts that i think i've ever thought about in my life now like the pain of regret is very uncomfortable like i, I try to tell people in 50 years when you're done coaching when you're 70 years old like younger coaches right when you're 70 years old and you look back on all the things you did are you going to be proud of what you did or are you going to be cringing at the things that you said yourself and unfortunately i think there are a lot of coaches out there i'm not going to name them i'm not a gossiper but a lot of coaches who are looking back on the last 10 years and going oh my goodness, what have I done? I can't believe I got wrapped up in 
chasing the status and the money and the attention, right? Like that's a, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bantering on here, but like I've been in places 10 years ago, sitting in groups of like a clinic or something like that. And it's just sad to see like how a couple coaches are addicted to the status. They love that people want to, you know, they praise them and they think they're awesome and they're a national, international rank. And they're so addicted to the attention and the approval of other people that it, they become power hungry. That's exactly what I think it is. Yeah. is they become, it is. They, sorry, they go ahead. Yeah. They become addicted to that external validation and it's super dangerous and vulnerable because it's always changing. It's never enough. There's never enough money. There's never enough status. There's never enough likes on Instagram. You always want more and it is dangerous. And then I want to hear what your thoughts, but I'll tell you the solution that I, I kind of went through. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I get that because I spent my whole life like going back in, like sort of thinking about it personally with the gymnastics because I was always the hard worker that never really made it. You know, I was elite, but never quite in the team. I was the one that, um, you know, and it was, it was at one minute, it would be my weight. And then it was the fact that I'd grown and then I, you know, my body had changed shape, literally felt like overnight. And we had some Russian guy come over um, when I was training in the UK and he made comment on that and it was one comment that really hit hard like I'd be so much better if I didn't have the shape that I had I mean I, I was five foot you know I was like five foot two and under eight stone and yet that still wasn't right so you know it but I was lucky that I had also had other coaches that told me that I was okay so mm. It was, it's which voice do you listen to? But I spent years listening to that negative one and even working to the point where I was doing my full-time job. And this is how it impacts on the bigger scale that I was doing my full-time job. I was studying my PhD. I was raising my family and yet I still wasn't good enough. And it wasn't until I'd looked in my mirror the day after my graduation went from my PhD and I thought this has got to stop because I was tired I was so tired and I think you know whether it's in coaching whether it's in teaching whatever aspect of your life it stays with you because it's such a big part of you and it's the holistic you and that's where you know these coaches when they look come back are they getting enough opportunity to reflect you know they see do they take stock it's so easy to get caught up and going and going and going and going and you just don't stop and it's almost like if you stop you're going to lose face so you've just got to keep going mm. and if I suddenly back down from saying that that's not okay you know that what I'm doing is not okay they're hitting that reflection too late because they probably didn't hear the voices of those gymnasts early enough mm. and with kids they're not necessarily going to say it out loud and that's why I think as a coach as well you need to look at the body language of your gymnasts when they talk to you you know are they warm with you look at look at them really look at them you know looking look at their eyes look at their faces you know because you can see it change in a moment and I even last night I had a little girl that was working really hard on something and it just wasn't coming you know I could say it in a hundred different ways and it still wasn't there and I just said and it was the I really love and I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination but it was saying to her I love how much effort you've put in tonight we'll get this and you can do this but it's going to take time it doesn't happen overnight and it's almost that reassurance that you're doing you're working so hard and it's looking at the other aspects not just the end result mm. uh, you know sometimes you've got to fail a hundred times thousands of times before you succeed and I think you know maybe coaches at that elite end can forget that that even themselves they're not perfect um, and they need to be reflecting regularly and having a forum, whether it's a forum as elite coaches, that is almost like a closed door just for them, where they can voice off and they can say, I got that wrong today mm. and be in a place. Maybe they're not in a place where they have that safety net yeah. and they don't actually have that psychological safety net that you were talking about earlier themselves. Yeah. You know? Because if they don't, then they can't reflect because if they put it out there, they might, they might not know something yeah. or they might have got it wrong. And there's all these people behind them following getting it wrong. Yep. then they're not going to go out and say, hey, I got it wrong, guys, because then everybody has to change, you know, and then the finger's going to be pointing at them. And we are very quick. You know, you go into a restaurant. How many times do we say that was a really good meal? Thank you. More often than not, we'll just complain if it's a bit nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. Yeah, I mean. I really, I really value everything you're saying here. And I, I definitely want to make sure we talk because I want to give a lot of value to people. I think people are really going to resonate with this quite a bit. But like the the thought or the, the point you made about someone, one person's comment about you from, a, you never knew this guy. You've never met this guy. No, coming no. In. 
And I never saw him again. He came into the gym once. I happened to be in at the same time as him and we were doing handsprings. And it was the weight of the change of my body, as in I wasn't a little girl body anymore. I was now a teenage body. And it was my teenage body that was holding me back and I couldn't do the skill that I needed to do particularly well because of the weight of my upper body over my lower body. Again, this comes back social judgment, right? Like this, this, this external, like the fear of social judgment and the fear of social rejection is so rare. It's, it's why so many young kids struggle with mental health things, especially with social media and rising. We'll talk about that, but yeah. I really want people to, to like almost pause the podcast and think about this for a while. Like it, it takes one comment, one thing. And I've had many athletes that I've seen with this, like a uh, uh, body image issue or something about their looks or something about their performance, right? It takes one external comment to start internal demons forever. You know what I mean? Like kids hear these one or two comments and then they get follow-ups like spirals into in their head. You know, we all know the the things that you say to yourself or sometimes you're like, that's not, that's not real. That's not me. That's like, that's emotion and these insecurities and fears and the, the, the fear of the unknown, the worst case scenario. And I think, I'll be totally honest. When I had the same thing when I was younger, I had such a, you know, my family is a little bit like on the stockier side. So I was never super lean and super shredded like my teammates. I wasn't super mm. talented. So I wasn't competing in lineup and I was really insecure about that. I was really insecure about the way I looked. I was insecure about my skill level in gymnastics. And I was really insecure about just like my popularity, right? Just like back in the day when I cared a lot about that as a younger a high schooler, I wanted people to like me. You know what I mean? Like, I, like everybody does, you know what I mean? Not that I don't want that now, but like I don't, I don't depend on it. But those things were driving so much of why I, you know, acted in such a ridiculous way towards my my career. And, and I think a lot of people should think about that. Like, what are my own fears? What are my own insecurities? Am I a little bit too dependent on external relationships? Like, is, is Facebook and Instagram dictating my happiness levels? Like, up and down. It's a tool that you can choose to use for better or for worse. And to kind of come on the positive side of this, I think the the big change for me. You were talking about how you had that kind of like, you know, that moment of like, this has to stop. I had that too. And I was like, maybe like six or seven years ago now. Um, yeah. Some of the gymnasts that I was saying, like, can't, kind of spoke up and said, we don't like you. And like, also, I just was really depressed. I was really unhappy with being dependent on everyone's approval and trying yeah. to be always impressing people and talking about myself. Like it was really like, it, it gives you a lot of social anxiety when you're constantly worried about what people think about you. And, you know, you often feel like you're alone in a crowded room because you're always just worried about like, what are people saying about me? I would think like, I would hear somebody whisper something and I was like, they're talking about me. They're definitely talking about yes. me. Because <laughs> they're that important. But yeah. that's how mind work, isn't it? And my mind was like worst case scenario spiral, right? So like, I think the shift happened for me when I, I read a lot of books, I really look up to a lot of people who I value. And like what I saw is like, they live their life based on their values and not other people's opinions. Yes. You know what I mean? They, they genuinely care more about their opinion of themselves than the opinion of other people. And now I want to make this clear. That is not, don't listen to anybody. What it means is if your core group of friends, if my best friend, right, or my, my, my boss, who's my best friend as well, if they tell me you're being a jerk, I'm like, okay, pause, listen. Right? But if like Sally Jones 44 on Facebook says I'm a piece of crap, I'm like, all right, Sally, you don't really know. <laughs> I don't know what I've been through, but like if the overall consensus is like, Hey, fix this, then like, yeah, you should probably per perk your ears up, but like, don't listen to the comments. Don't be so uh, attuned to what everybody says, because most of those people are just hurting inside and they need help. They're, de they're insecure. They have their own demons and they're just trying to rip you down. You know what I mean? So like, that's really important. But two is, and I want, I actually, I don't know if you know this research and I want to hear your opinion on this, but I read a couple books about sustained behavior change and what what they think yeah. makes sustained behavior change and the i think it's from northwestern the researchers here in the states is they were saying when you coach for compliance the external thing what this is what you're doing wrong fix this like a very regimented da -da 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 point of view that doesn't really get sustained behavior change because it activates you know more of the sympathetic drive you get a lot of vagal tone that spikes up and people are defensive people are get a, an adrenaline stress response because someone's attacking them versus uh, approaching with like a coaching from compliance point of view, which is what's the ideal version of yourself that you'd like to be every day? What's the ideal future that you'd like to have for yourself? And then are your daily actions mapping to those end goals and small steps that helps me. And they've done uh, functional MRI studies where people who pose that question are much more open to feedback. They're much more in a parasympathetic kind of chilled out tone. They're open to these ideas. It's curiosity based. It's like, Hmm, it feels internal locus of control. I'm in control. I'm building my future. Not someone is attacking me from the outside. And that really resonated with me. I've changed out quite a bit about how I feel that way. And it's helped me a lot, not listen to 
um, or not get caught up in the social gossip and the noise and the, what everybody else is doing, the comparison. I have to do this because someone else is doing it. And I think a lot of coaches struggle with that and, and actually gymnasts and parents as well, too. So that would be my suggestion. That's helped me enormously with my mental health and also my my day to day efficiency. But I don't know. That's a lot. I rambled on there, but I really want to hear all your thoughts on on that. Well, I think that's one thing that's just so important. And when we are, you know, when we're t whether we're teaching, whether we're coaching, we need to do so. It's social emotional learning. That's what it mm -hmm. is. You know, yeah. FPL, it's got its own term and everything. And that's more like a recent project that I've just put some funding in for is looking at trauma-informed teaching and mental health um, in children in physical education. But again, it lends itself to coaching because what you're trying to do is empower empower children they don't come with a ready made knowledge to know what we know from books as 30 or you know 30 somethings 40 somethings 50 somethings whatever um 20 somethings you know we read the books we find it out they don't do that they haven't done that so every time they walk into the gym we need to be the people that empower them to do that our job is bigger than the physical and you know, ultimately, we need to be able to empower them to be able to do that. So they're questioning their value. What was important to you today? Not the, mm. I felt, are we taking that time to check in with those gymnasts? You know, so bringing it back into that as well. Um, you know, what did you do that you were proud of today? And it's making sure that they know what they're proud of today. Because actually, if it's just that I just didn't give up, you know, that's actually something really important. They're showing resilience right there. They keep bouncing back, you know, yeah. every physically <laughs> physically probably as well you know we've all been there probably landed on my head more times than i care to shake a stick at <laughs> but um that that's the thing that you know they're coming back with it and saying actually no i didn't quite get my skill today or i didn't quite get where i needed to do but i worked really hard on that today and it's recognizing is I think coming back to something I said at the beginning is recognizing that whole person and not just not just that person as the gymnast or that person that's going to be competing in so many weeks because mm. actually then they can transfer it's all transferable that if they know that their value in themselves is that actually I'm a really hard worker you know and I might not necessarily get there straight away but I work really hard at it it might take me 20 more goes than everyone else to get it but I still get there so you're actually teaching them something else, you know, and something else about themselves and being able to regulate and self-regulate is really important and to be able to tune out the voices that don't matter. Um, and I know that schools, schools and, you know, maybe coaches as well will do it um, as an add-on. So it's almost like a, it's a bolt-on instead of actually mm part of their practice yep. and I think if we can embed it so that's basically what pedagogy is which is the relationship between the teachers teaching the learners learning and the knowledge in context on in context so that's the triangle so first of all the most important part is the learners learning okay so we need to make sure that our relationship is strong with them first and vice versa so it goes the other way and then that knowledge in context so whether it's coaching gymnastics whether it's teaching it doesn't matter what it is that relationship and the things that go on within that that knowledge in context isn't just the physical it's actually making sure that we really are having that holistic view of that individual so when they walk out of the gym at however old they they may never look back but they might and it's at that point that they take it they take all of those good things with them so they have that value right from the start so their value is it for me for example michelle the gymnast michelle the coach it's actually just michelle and that's okay or michelle the mom or the wife or the other hats you know the other hats that i wear it's just about actually i just value i have value just being me and all of those other ones are lovely little add-ons that I have that also make up me. Um, so Borgia, if we're talking about theory, he has habitus field and practice. So habitus are the behaviors that we have, the things that we do without thinking. The practice are the things that we do, usually because they're the practices that we see within the field. So the field can be your home environment, the gym, your school. You're going to take elements of those and they're going to build up that whole person. Mm. Yeah. So that's why, and actually, and your practice then is how you act and how you behave. So, and it all filters down. It kind of, you know, we will copy other people within our field, which is why it's really important that we are, we are really are making them feel so valued as individuals first, then as the gymnast second, you know, then we can move forward from there. So 
yeah i think it's you know the things that they do without even thinking if they can have value on themselves without even thinking about it then you know we're already halfway there but that's a hard yeah. crack <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's a i have a good story for this i have a, a gymnast that i work with i'm not going to say her name because i love her to death and she would be embarrassed <laughs> um you know she's she oh God, it's crazy she's so much like me when i was younger she just struggles so much with you know she's ridiculous the hardest worker i've ever met in my entire life but she's just like she struggles with you know sometimes being like progressing at a faster rate like you and i did like she's like not just got god-given talent it's not going to be a level 10 elite situation right but yeah. she loves what she's doing it is and i remember like one day just after a lot of frustrations with like her just not really um being in a good headspace about like her own self-worth and stuff and being good enough she was valuing our opinions as coaches as her metric of success right and so she messaged me we have like a, a team um whatsapp board for all the coaches all the parents are involved right and she said something to me like um i finally like 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 yeah i just want to i just want to get you i just want to impress you or like I finally i impressed you and i was like whoa i was like that is not what we're doing here i was like you should never be dependent on me and impressing me or getting my approval for anything that you're doing right i was like that's not you should i was like you should always strive to be genuinely happy with yourself like if no if there was nobody watching and there was no cameras no lights like would you be proud of who you are and i think she like had a really emotional moment she like kind of teared up a little bit and like started like wow yeah that's really important i think that's what a lot of younger kids unfortunately with i don't think social media is the devil i think it's a tool we're using wrong but kids growing up in that maximal exposure to the internet and social media learn and get conditioned to it becomes their habit it's like i think you're saying is that i need approval and i need other people to tell me that that's what's that's what's good you know what i mean and survival instinct as well when they're really little you know like if i keep my parents happy then i'm not going to get told off so it's almost conditioned behavior yeah. if i so they're always right from the day they're born they're already trying to please us they're trying to please yeah. adults so when you take you know take a child into the gym they are going to do exactly the same because that's perfectly normalized behavior for them mm. you know please so to get them to move away from always pleasing is that's that's hard i think that's really yeah. really hard you know and it's about and it's reinforcing that message that i'm doing this with their like i'm doing this with one of my gymnasts at the moment and she's she's doing she's going on to FIG um, for Acro and she's absolutely lovely. Her skills are beautiful. Physically, she can do everything. She's amazing. But it's the confidence and the it's just confidence at the moment. It's just she's got this blocker on this particular skill that we're working on. And it's the motivation has had to then come from. So what I'm what, trying to do with her is get the motivation to come from her rather than from me. So mm -hmm. rather than feeling like she's being told off because she's not doing it, I'm like, it doesn't matter if you don't do it today. It's not a problem. OK, and I do. First thing, it's not a problem. We're just going to break it down and take it back a few paces. So we're still working on the same thing, but we've actually had to you know it's her for for whatever reason she's just got this fear of going backwards at the moment so it's like getting the barrel in like you do with the little ones just saying just play with that for a minute 10 minutes just play with the barrel just go backwards yep. okay that's you can't hurt yourself you can't do anything and it's just getting your head into the going backwards and she's like oh, okay so she was actually then starting to realize that she wasn't doing it for me she was doing it for her mm. so i Set her the tasks but actually it's got to come from her and i'm like when we've had enough you you know when you've had enough so anyway she was at that for ages a lot longer than you know where she was because she'll go off and hide and do something else when she doesn't want to do yeah. that so, yeah, <laughs> she's like, come on yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she's, she's got it's it is starting to work and i think mm. over time give her three months she'll be fine and it's giving her that time and i know gymnastics can be cruel in the sense that it doesn't give you a lot of time you know there's a very very tiny window mm. but i'm hoping that if we can get her to a point where she's motivated for herself she's doing it for herself and not to please everybody else then we're going to start you know we're going to start being able to move forwards with her yeah. um, and that would be a really great space because then she knows that she's overcome the challenge, you know, but she did it for her, not for me, not for anyone else. She's doing it for her. Yeah. You raise a really good point there. And that's kind of, that's what I was going to suggest as a follow-up for like kind of how, how to help with this is I think that gymnasts are just kind of bred. It's, it's just a selected sport for more of the type A that I want results. I need objective facts to tell me what's going on. And when you combine that with the inherent negativity bias that we have because it's a survival instinct, right? Like you need to remember the negative things more than the positive because don't eat those berries. That was where a tiger lived back in the like way back in the day. That's how we were formed, right? Like you don't yeah. want to die, right? Don't drink that water. It's got malaria or something like that, right? Yeah. So we're, we still have that condition. And I think that's what happens is everybody listening to this podcast knows they think they dwell and think more about the negative things and they're more in there than the positive. They typically 
overlook the positive things in their life that they're doing and they, they focus on the negative, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. But that's what I experienced with a lot of the athletes that I work with is there's very little time where they reflect on generally what they did well or their positive things or, or good progress. And they only focus on the negative. And I think that's what was happening with a lot of the athletes that we're having this problem with. It's what happened with me as a coach. And I see it in a lot of other people around the world is they're not their sense of self-worth is coming from the external thing, not from genuinely are, am I living in line with my values? And like, what are the things about me that make me a good human that I should be proud of? And that that's how I know I'm doing the right thing. Um, and I think that society in general around the world kind of like has this, like always be humble, never, you know, don't praise yourself. But there's a fine line. There's a difference between ego and delusion and just self-confidence. <laughs> yeah. And the more that, for me, the more that I've focused on this, the more I've taught some of the athletes that I work with to focus on um, what's the evidence neutrally, not delusions of grandeur and not, you know, negative doesn't help you and living in delusional land doesn't help you at all. What's the neutral statements or facts of objective evidence of things that you've done that make you awesome? You know what I mean? And so for you, you just, it's not, not about, oh, I finally got this skill or I got this score. It's like I showed up every day. You know what I mean? Like I still kept going. Like my, I'm a, I, I have empathy. I treat my teammates well. I'm very good at these few things. Like I have a relentless work ethic. Like, you know, that kind of stuff I think is what builds positive self-esteem in the kids and it comes from an internal clock where they can say i i have value from myself and i think that's kind of a good takeaway is teach people to critique themselves in a in a in a nice way but like look at the positives actively seek out the positive things and i have to do that i have to kind of reflect on like all right like if i'm really in a tough mood or i'm going through some shit, like what are things that like I'm doing for myself that I know are good human characteristics or like things that are objective progress. And it helps you detach from the need for everyone to tell you that you're enough and tell you that you're, you're pretty and you're smart and you're funny and you're intelligent and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's really where people should try to for themselves do that. But then also with their athletes is like point out the objective things that are like, no, you, you are doing this well and you deserve to be happy for this. And you should be proud of that. You know what I mean? Instead of just dwelling all on the negative or like what they need to do better to get improvement you know what I mean so that's just a, a side caveat yeah and I think yeah I mean I, I think also with that that is you know I was talking about empowerment earlier mm -hmm. that's exactly that sort of shows what that's exactly what it is you know it's empowering those children so they can say no to things they can say you know they're doing that if something feels really uncomfortable they can recognize that and rather than just being the people pleaser they can say you know weigh it up so actually let's have that conversation let's weigh it up do we do enough of that on coach education you know where the kids are actually doing it for themselves you know where they're working for themselves where they are where we're empowering them to do it and be motivated and to be self, not just self-motivated, I'm going to walk in the gym because I want to, not because my mum said I have to, but actually going in there because and doing what you do, but also being able to say no to somebody who has, who's perceived to having power over you. Mm. Um, because if these young children that are coming into the gym and they're walking into the gym and all they've ever done is had to please their parents, then they come in to a gym where they're pleasing their coaches. You know, we were talking about that recipe, you know, sort yeah. of tying into athlete A, they're not going to say no to people that they trust and people that they want to impress and all of that. So we almost have to, as the coaches, as teachers, just as adults, we need to parents, we need to build that armor so strongly that they recognize when things aren't right they they become children are very intuitive intuitive but they probably don't do that enough because they're told not to mm. or oh don't be silly do you know what i mean oh don't be silly you'll be fine and actually maybe just by the way we speak to these speak to the children and recognize well how do you feel about that and it might be a 30 second conversation I'm not saying dwell on it because the more they dwell on it you know suddenly things can get a bit scarier when you like teaching a new skill or they're doing something for the first time but actually it's to recognize how they feel and trust how they feel and that it's okay to feel that way um and then you can come back into it and say right okay now we've acknowledged it what's the worst that can happen all right if you keep your arms straight you're not going to land on your head if you you know what goes up comes down we know you're going to land in some way you know i always make a joke of it but <laughs> it's like you you've done all the progression so you know your body's going to turn and chances are you're going to land on your feet. So as long as you go for it and you do everything that you've already built up to, it's going to be fine. And it's that reassurance, but actually they're making decisions for themselves. And I think COVID has been one blessing in our gym 
where we've had to do things differently because we're not allowed any hands on whatsoever. Right. So right. we've had to like everything's hands off. So everything we've done has had to be completely coached without new skills, you name it, without any manual handling, so to speak. Yep. So we've had to think of creative ways of progression, creative ways of getting children to do things for the first time. Like normally you'd stand, can you just stand underneath that? Can you just stand underneath it? Yeah, 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 I'll stand there. So even just standing there, they're still having confidence in me instead of confidence in them. So it's retraining them to actually have all the confidence in themselves and that, yeah, I can give you a little tap if you need to, but actually I don't need to because you've done so well. This is about you now. So so there is an element of handling, obviously, as the skills get more complicated. But if we progress them well enough, then the onus needs to be on them. And although you have that trust in that coach, the coach has to have the trust in the gymnast that they're going to make it mm. um, rather than actually I do have to stand. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I stood underneath that skill. And look at me, you know, <laughs> whereas you can kind of if you oh, look at me supporting a double back. Woo oh, right. um, you know, you kind of you've got to step away from that and actually allow them to be able to do it for themselves. Yeah, you know? that, that's back to that what we just talked about. That I oh mean, that was so me. That was like, look at me spotting double backs. Like, look yeah, at yeah. Me, right? <laughs> again. That's that's seeking an addiction to status. That's addiction to praise. You're like your self worth does not come from the fact that you have four girls you can spot on double backs at a meet and look so cool in front of everybody. You're, like that's not yeah. what, the real real value comes from uh, someone doing it by themselves and confidently and having no negative repercussions. And you're, you're, you should be proud of the relationship and the process of going through that journey together as a coach pair. You should be proud of the fact that you're such a good human, that your, your athletes value enough to be around you and follow your positive example and be a part of your gym. That's where you you should come from because if you're a good human and you're knowledgeable and you're, you're admitting your mistakes and you're constantly learning and they're getting better because of that, that's where your worth should come from. Not because you can spot gingers and you can show off how cool you can spot and like all that kind of stuff. Like that's not, not a good long. No, it really isn't. And that's where coming back to your belief system as well, your internal belief system about yourself and how you interact with other people, you, everything you do is a reflection of you. So ultimately one, we need to be reflective because we need to be reflective of how we're interacting. I know when I've had an absolute stinker of a day, I've probably come in like a bear with a sore head and I do have to have a little chat with myself, you know, and it's like, come on, yep. <laughs> you know, you're in your happy place now, let's go with it. And you stick your smile on the dial and you roll with it. And you know, you can, you can have a really good session and put that energy into positive. You know, it's always why waste all your time on the negative when you can be enjoying all that positive and it, you get less wrinkles from smiling apparently so <laughs> <laughs> you know you've got to you've got to roll with you know I think you've got to roll with that and be able to but you know to be able to take that and not and you know what was I saying I've lost from my track now <laughs> I lost my okay. brain. I was yeah, thinking no. about wrinkles and looking at myself on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me share something and it'll give you time to think. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to go back to when you were saying like the, how important it is for the athlete to be the one driving their own ship, right? In the, in the whole yeah. journey here, right? It's that I always tell them, you're the hero. Um, I'm just your guide. You're the hero in the story and I'm just helping you out. And I really believe in that. Um, and I think that it comes on the I think a lot of people sometimes have this conversation about like, yeah, but how can we not call out bad behavior? Can we not critique people for their, oh, their no, no, not at all. Right. And I think that's, yeah. it's more important to actually have this conversation with that because I, I try to tell people like the, the athletes that I coach, I'm like, you don't have to do anything. This is a choice. Conditioning is a choice. Doing these skills is a choice. Showing up is a choice, but you do have to deal with the consequences of your choices, good or yeah. bad. So like, you, if you don't want to do all the strength and you don't want to show up and, and work hard, then like, okay, that, that's your decision. But when we get to a meet and you're really upset with your performance or you're not progressing and maybe some of the other athletes are moving to the next level in a year, like we're going to reflect back on this. And I love you the same either way, but we're going to have a conversation about, okay, did we make every choice towards our goal? And did we put in the work and did we make sacrifices when we needed to? And if not, that's a reflection of your choices and your actions. And I think, okay, if you're upset and you don't like the way this feels, again, going back to leaning into emotional discomfort and actively seeking out you know, discomfort like that every day. Um, are you happy with how you feel right now and the results? If not, then make some changes. You know what I mean? Like, like I think it's a really valuable lesson that we're trying to teach kids in the sport and that a lot of us learn from our coaches is like what you do and your daily behaviors 
if they're based on good values and they map toward your goals over time, regardless of the result, you'll be happy with the process and you'll be happy with the, the journey. Even if you don't win, even if you don't get your goal, you'll know that you did everything you possibly could to, yeah. to come out the other side happier with yourself. Or you're going to live in some regret because maybe you're going to look back and be like, oh, yeah, I kind of I sacrificed my values there. I did something I wasn't proud of this. That didn't feel great because I made someone feel bad. You know what I mean? Like, that's really important. I think that's you should be able to critique people's behaviors and say, like, OK, the way you're acting right now is not in line with our gym's moral standards and, and the way that we operate. So um, change or we're going to have a different conversation. And if you don't like how this feels when I'm normally all happy and bubbly at practice and I'm kind of coming down on you and saying like, Hey, this isn't okay. If you're not okay with how this feels, go home and reflect on maybe there's something that I did to, to, to have that happen. And I should be the one responsible. I take ownership of that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it is about them taking ownership for their own behaviors and deciding whether it's okay to behave that way and i think as long as we are like you're saying with the values if you're mapping everything against those your own values so even if you're if, you, if it's always coming from a good place that's that's my sort of rule of thumb i'd say not on an academic level just generally yeah. uh, that if it's coming from a good place so whether you're talking to the coach that's the power hungry um you know not what you want kind of coach then or the, the behaviors that are upsetting you just it doesn't have to be you did this wrong you did that wrong you're not accusing mm -hmm. you just say, actually this is how it made me feel I just felt really uncomfortable with that and it's the same with that gymnast you know so what what's going on why did you behave that way and it's talking about you know whenever you've had some form of discomfort emotional discomfort or they're doing something that they shouldn't we need to flip it back and we need to restore it afterwards so it's called like restorative justice so actually mm. you have that conversation and through that conversation you're helping them recognize what was okay and what was not okay but it's leading that conversation effectively to make that work because again you know like you were saying earlier if it's just that's how it needs to be you behave that way that's the end of it if they don't understand the reasons why they'll resort straight back to doing what they were doing before because that's clearly okay to them until they're told that it's not so whether it's bullying behavior or whether it's just generally being lazy and not doing what they should be doing or um distracting other people you know you've got to work with actually what are the reasons behind that is it that just that they're being difficult or is it actually that they're scared to death of doing whatever you're doing or not necessarily scared but you know they've got reservations or they're not fitting into the group as well as they would like to fit into the group so by having that conversation afterwards you can actually start to bring that back down and get to the root of it and then deal with it um and it may take a couple of goes you know it's always benefit of the doubt isn't it you know <laughs> until there's no more doubt and then it's like now nah, come on yeah. we're done now and that's about having secure boundaries and i think if you replicate if you do that yourself all those kids that are watching you do that know that you're one you're dealing with it with kindness it's coming from a good place but also you're showing that boundaries are okay and again with the abusive situation you know if you've got an amazing gymnast that then moves and they go to another gym if they know what good coaching feels like and then they have an experience where it's not so good um not necessarily technically or anything like that but how they're being treated they can actually say yes these are my boundaries I'm not okay with this mm -hmm actually put the hand up and say and again that comes back down to the empowerment that part of their belief system has that empowerment but also with coaches it's changing the way they speak to their gymnasts to to change their practice mm. yeah i mean you said something that resonates with me so well and i i firmly believe in is is how do you how, how do you get the confidence to go uphill i think against against the boulder you know what i mean like pushing up yeah. If your intentions are good, genuinely good, like you know your intentions are good, and the only one who knows that is you, right? You are the only one who knows whether you're chasing money, status, and you're addicted to external praise, or you generally are trying to be the best human that you can, and you just want to, you value the things that are important. If your intentions are good, and in your mind, you know, I did everything that I could within my control to live in, in alignment with my values, if those two things are in place, I almost feel like you can weather any storm. I feel I teach this to, I, I actively journal about this almost every day, but I also teach this to the athletes that I work with or people who ask me my advice on stuff, which I'm super like grateful that people value my opinion is like, you can deal with social media trolls. You can deal with the gossip. You can deal with not getting the result that you like 
desperately worked for for so long if your intentions are good and you did everything in your control to influence a positive outcome. And if you reflect back, which everyone should do is the first time problems come up or you don't get something that doesn't work out well, or it feels icky when you're kind of working in like a, a problem, you should go, okay, what's my role? You should go, where are my intentions good? Did I chase the right thing? Did I care about the athletes as a human? And the end result is not what's the only thing. And two is, did I do everything in my control to make a positive influence? Right. And if you, if your answer to yourself is yes, on both of those two things, like, yes, my intentions were good. Yes. I did everything I could. Then you can walk away completely with the, your head up, you know, like, okay, I'm going to learn from this mistake. It's, it sucks. It doesn't feel good right now, but I'm going to learn from this and I'm going to find the people to teach me what I need to be better. I'm going to find the resources to improve. I'm going to, maybe I didn't know something and I, I realized, whoop, I really need to learn this quite a bit, you know? So yeah. I, th I think people should really rest on that because I, I, I'm sorry. Do you have a, do you have to leave at any time? I'm no, like, no, no, no. I'm good. <laughs> I'm fine. An hour. I'm like, oh crap, we're already over. But if you have more time. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah so I was saying is, um, if people have those intentions are good, that's where you get the confidence in yourself to start not even being a whistleblower, but just like starting to do something that's different. If you're not happy with how you feel every day, then change something. Just like we say with the kid, you know what I mean? And then it is because it becomes a uh, emotional contagion is real as my buddy Nick has said, but also social, social dynamics change when other people, if you have one or two people around you who are sailing your ship in the same direction, it's really empowering for you to feel that you can speak up. So I think if your own personal intentions are good and you, and you choose to surround yourself with people who also share those values and those intentions, that's how things really start to get going. And, and that's kind of where I want our conversation to go is so many people desperately want change. I've talked to a lot of people from a lot of countries in the last six months with the pandemic and people, ex Olympians, very high level people who are just like, I'm, I, I am sick of this. I am sick of this that we're living in. I'm sick of these coaches not listening to injuries. I'm sick of parents who are just refusing to be not be so hardcore about levels. I'm tired of NGBs who are not uh, calling people out and holding them accountable. So what do we, how do we help people who really want change and feel stuck under a million pound rock? What, what I don't know if there's research that you feel is supportive of like what people can actually do to, to start to initiate a change in their own beliefs and a change in their environment or, or anything else that you feel is important. I think it's looking at, oh, is somebody competent mm. uh, in terms of being able to make that change happen? Okay. The next one is motivation. So do they have the motivation to change? That's a big one. All right. So when you're looking at someone who's a high level, really high level coach, and they've been at the top of their game for a very long time, and their practices aren't necessarily what they should be, let's actually focus on the positive things that they've done. <laughs> I personally feel that positive change is better. There's combi, which is all about behavior change and that's more of a psychological thing yeah. but i think actually you know are they are you comp are they competent in promoting that change mm. so actually you know if you look and go oh my goodness you know you've done an amazing job with those you know with those gymnasts and you've done this and you're actually saying and you you know you're saying that's really great however there's always that however not always a but but actually saying to them you know what how did you how did you deal with that and it's actually, it's about asking, I think personally, it's about asking the right questions and dealing with it positively and putting those nuggets of positivity mm. into the negative practice. So if it's the way that they're speaking to somebody, you know, and they're being really off with them or rude to them or just very flippant and not really caring, you're going, do you actually, you know, how do you feel about your gymnasts? And actually, when they have that conversation, and it's like, I really care about them. They don't just go in. I can't believe for one second that they would only go in to do gymnastic skills. They go in because they love their athletes and they care about them passionately. You know, they they really want the best for them, you know, not just for them. Yes, there is an element of if they're a bit ego orientated, then it's going to be a bit for themselves. And that needs stamping out. And like I said, when it's borderline on the abusive side, it's about giving it. So it's sort of pronged in different directions it's empowering the children you know the gymnasts the athletes other coaches to be able to address that separately but if it's just the conversation in the gym it's like can you how do you feel like you know how do you feel about your gymnasts how do you feel about how they feel I saw a face drop when you said that do you think mm -hmm. it might upset her do you yeah. know what I mean you're actually asking for them for your professional opinion if I'm so you're going in and you can be asking for their opinion on something you know if I was dealing with a with kid that was doing that how would you deal with it and yeah. say oh do you know what I tried doing it this other way and do you know what it really worked you know we got it done ever so quick because she felt quite good about herself yeah. and if you actually are dealt with 
do you care about your athletes? And if the answer is no, why is that coach even in the gym? You know, that that has got to be a whole different. And then that is actually a different that's a different thing. If it's somebody who's genuinely doing something because they don't know any other way of doing it or they've never really had opportunity to reflect and question, just by empowering those other coaches to question, and I'm not saying you did that wrong, what did you do? It's about saying, I love the way you did this. However, I just saw that gymnast do this or I've got a gymnast. So you're actually asking for their expertise but framing it in a way that they're actually reflect, having opportunity to reflect themselves. And it might be something that they make a flippant sort of response maybe in the gym, but they may go home and think about it. And actually it's those small, it's those small tiny little steps that actually do I want to change? And if they don't want to change and they're still behaving that same way, then actually they need to not be there. And that's when the NGBs need to be stronger. That's when our, you know, whether it's whistleblowing policies or whatever, need to be there. Um, because actually, when you look at the socialization of what a gymnast looks like and how things, you know, what they should be, there was, you know, they're sort of saying that was socialized as well, you know, because little children were a lot easier to throw about, for coaches to throw about, mm. um, you know, supporting and stuff and doing new things. Um, but, you know, with a with an older, you know, an older gymnast, or you've got a gymnast that have their own mind, you're dealing with a different, you're dealing with an adult. So are adult gymnasts going to be so easily manipulated by coaches that are refusing to change, providing that everyone else along the way is, you know, those top coaches are never at the bottom end. So actually at the bottom end, are we doing a good, you know, a good job in empowering those children so mm. that when they come up, they're going to stand up against those coaches, you know, yeah. we it, that needs to happen but in the same breath yes about creating change in your own space coming back to the question yeah. how are you framing your conversations and i think that's really important so yeah. competency and motivation to change yeah that's so valuable and i think in the landscape that we're living through now whereas this is almost it used to become you could kind of get away with not having these conversations and because it wasn't so in the spotlight it wasn't so talked about but now it's like yeah figure it out or it's going to be figured out for you. And I think there's kind of like, I'm, I'm just like trying to like put this together in my head. Cause I really want to make sure I'm, I'm keeping up with, with what you're saying. And it's, it's intelligent in my mind. Um, I think there's like three steps that everybody should have. You should block out two hours tomorrow in the morning where you yeah. have three questions to yourself. You say, number one, what do you want out of being in gymnastics? Like, do you, what do you want personally for yourself? What do you want for your athletes? Whatever it is like, in, in, and it's like a, almost like a, a flow chart in my mind of like, if it's a, if it's a positive, yeah. or negative, like if it's a positive, keep going. If it's a negative, figure it out. You know, what I mean? like if, yeah, if, yeah. positive, if your, if your intentions are great and you really know you're, you're doing it for the kids and it's not selfish, it's actually selfless and you want what's best for the community because it makes you happy and it makes you feel good and you want to give back. That's what you should be doing. That's why you should be involved, right? Not for, if it's for the money, for the status, for your own sense of praise and to, to have an ego, then like you should seriously think hard about what you're doing right now. Cause I'm telling you for a fact, you either will need to change or you will get changed. You will get asked to leave the sport. That's the way it's going here is where there's a, thankfully there's finally like a no, I'm just saying there's no bullshit anymore. You know what I mean? If you're not, if you're not living in, in line with good values and you're treating kids well, you're going to be called out. And you should be, you know what I mean? So if you, if you honestly have that conversation, you're like, oh no, I'm drifting away from my moral compass, get back on track and you can fix it and you can get back in line. That's great. But once you get past that, it's like, okay, why do you want those things? What, like, again, back to it. Why do you really want those things? If you want it for the right reasons, like we just said, that's awesome. If you want it for the wrong reasons, have a hard conversation with yourself or get a best friend to do it. And then lastly, it's like, okay, if my intentions are good and I know why I like this, do I have all the skills and the things that I need to be successful? And I think that's kind of where most people lie is there's so many subcategories in gymnastics, right? If you do have, so say you're, a, so I'm going to use my, myself as an example, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a decent coach, but I have a lot more to, to, to learn. I'm, I'm pretty good at the medical stuff. Right. And I also believe I have my values lined up. Those are the three things that I'm really good at. What I'm not is I'm not an expert coach. So I need help with that. That's where like Nick and all my friends come in. Right. I'm not a nutritionist. So I need to find somebody to help me out with that. I'm not a mental skills provider. I need a psychologist or someone to help me out. And I network and I find these people I'm learning myself, but I'm finding people to help me out with that kind of stuff. My boss has her master in mental health. She's amazing. She teaches me so much, right? So if you have those skills you need in an audit, a self audit, 
then keep going, master those skills. Like I'm trying to master my medical practice. I'm trying to master my, my positive role modeling and my values and stuff like that. But I need help with the rest. And don't be afraid to say that. And if they're not there, then find them out, go online, find resources. You know, we can't with COVID as much for clinics, but there's so much online. There's so many people to network with that you can find. And I think that's what people should be having as their kind of like step-by-step -step process to go through. Is, yeah. is this what I, am I doing this well? Am I going to be someone who's, who's positive? Because Ian, you're trying to maximize the positive outcome on the end. It's like you don't want to live with regret in 10 years and doing it wrong. And you don't want to be someone who's caught in the wake of destruction when somebody comes back to your gym and says, by the way, I hated my experience. And hey, I kind of hated you. So I just want to let you know, you know, like yeah. you do not want to swallow that regret. But that comes too late. You know, if they're coming back to the gym to say that, it's come way too late. So there's all these other processes that need to go in in the first place. And I think also with coach education, coaches don't just become elite coaches. They have to work through a process to get there. So yeah. that process needs to be far more um not just focused i think historically it's been very much focused on the physical um and the physical develop you know sort of the physical as in gymnastic development but where's the development in children and child development and their mental you know sort of their mental capacity at different ages and stages and their physical and the fact that when they start growing you they're going to lose flexibility and their bodies are going to you know and this particularly with girls i'm not so much sure with boys but i know with girls in particular you know they are more prone to injury as their muscles and bones and ligaments and everything else grow at different rates and that can cause problems and it's all of those things and it's actually accepting that that's normal instead of muscling through it work mm. With it do you know what i mean in a way that actually you come out with a healthy mm. you know with a healthy athlete you know and a healthy person first mm. really healthy person on the other end and things like so there's something called self-determination theory which looks at how your what your motivations are and we need to make sure that children have the decision, do they have opportunity to make decisions? So when we're coaching, do they actually have opportunity to make decisions about what's gonna happen to them next? Or are we just telling them? Yeah, so that's the first one. And the second one is um, structure and competence. Do they have a structure where they feel competent? So are we putting it at the right level? So effectively, if their functional skill functional sort of skills aren't working correctly and you know they're not strong enough for something then why are we pushing on that skill take it back a bit do the conditioning do the prep don't be scared to go back to the prep and that's okay um whereas some will just keep i've seen kids in competition before where they're chucking these skills and it's i you know i don't scare easily but you're literally sick in your mouth watching them because you think oh dear god they're gonna they're gonna break the necks and you yep. can almost see the accident before it happens because they've not been prepared enough so yep. it's actually if coaches and gymnasts themselves are standing up and saying no we're not doing this then actually in terms of competition and the ngbs and everything else they're going to have to do the same because if the gym club if the gym clubs vote with their feet that's the masses isn't it you know by having safe strong practice and then either the strongest are going to go through or the ones that you know the ones that are the ones that are ready you know rather than chucking left right and center where they're not ready and it's not okay and you know they're training on injuries and you know take that out if they're injured they shouldn't be there you know if they can't walk on it take them out you know it's not hero status that's not okay mm. um, and it's actually making it socially unacceptable don't give them hero status because they competed on an injury you know actually take time out go to the next competition it's perfectly okay to go to the next one yeah. Um, so that's where the systems, you know, the systems can change with that. And then the last one is relatedness. Do they have that sense of belonging? <clears throat> so if they've got that sense of belonging in your gym because you're looking after them and they're looking after you and they feel that empowerment and they feel safe and secure, they're going to do stuff because they want to. And again, that is the bit where they are motivated for themselves. They're not motivated because their coach is telling them to do it and they're not turning up to practice thinking, oh, God, I've got another four hours of this and I don't want to be here. Yeah, right. <laughs> so because parents are invested as well, you know, whether it's financially, emotionally, the sacrifices they make. I mean, one of my daughters trains, you know, she's already training four times a week and she's, you know, she's eight. But it's, you know, it's that she's lucky because I'm in the gym, but I don't actually coach her because I, I did when she was, you know, when she was development development, I did. And now she's moved on to squad. So I'm like, nah, I don't want to coach her because I want to get in the car with her and go, hey, how was your session? <laughs> was it fun? Did you have a nice time? Yeah. And I 
that's the you know so her you know her biggest thing the other day was i i what did she say the other day oh i i managed to go the whole session without falling over right <laughs> Nice. Well done, you know, she's notoriously, notoriously clumsy. clumsy. So, you know, or I did the whole set. I didn't go, that was it. She said, I didn't go for a wee. <laughs> it's the small things. <laughs> a little wee, right? little wee. That, Mom, rather than going, did you get that flick? Did you sort that out? Did you get that for a bit? You right. know, that she'll just tell me those bits as and when, you know, and I look over occasionally. But she was so excited because she'd managed to go a whole hour and a half without needing a wee. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> so funny um yeah and i, I think uh, i really want to pause and just make sure that we, we say this clearly is that you and i and everybody else who's doing this like we're coming from a place of of empathy and love and we we genuinely want to this is not this is not a situation where we're trying to i god i just don't like gossip i'm just not a gossiper like i really think that's a disservice is when you spend your life just trying to attack people there's a difference between reporting someone and calling out their actions and holding them yeah. accountable and just yeah. dragging someone through the mud you know what i mean and so i think that like i'm really trying to make sure that the podcast and everything that i do and the people that i work with is it's, it comes from i desperately want you to be happier and healthier and i think that's important for coaches to realize and parents listening to this and professionals is like that's uh i read a really interesting book this is this is a really random tangent but like when i was going through a lot like five ten years ago i had a lot of issues with depression i read a book called lincoln's melancholy and how he um actually was one of the most depressed people that's ever you know been in office stuff but it taught him empathy and i think that like a lot of the things that i've been through the roller coaster and what i've seen other coaches like nick and friends of mine who have had a roller coaster is it really gives you a deep sense of empathy for like what people are going for i feel with all of my heart and in my bones the pain of some coaches and of some people who are some of the worst offenders of, you know, being, you know, someone who's egotistical and stuff is like, you know, deep down inside behind the scenes is that they're hurting. They're desperately hurting because think about the life they lead when someone has to be top, do they have that support network. Yeah. You know I mean? As young coaches or as sort of early, early career coaches, there's this network of support and it's okay. Cause you're just in and you just come in and that's okay. They're under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And it's not so easy just to put the hands up and say, I'm really sorry, my bad, no. you know? No. So absolutely. You know, and everyone is, you can never do anything right. When you're at that level, the higher status you get and the more pressure yeah. you're under, no matter what you do, someone always has something to say about it. Someone always has a critique to say there's always more improvement and stuff. And so I feel for people and I want people, but like the reason I'm, I'm kind of giving tough love to people. And I think that many people are getting tough love now is because I know that you're not as happy as you could be. Like there's, there's a lot of happiness and a lot of health for you mentally on the other side of pushing through this challenge and this discomfort. So like, don't treat it as an attack. And like, I'm on my ivory tower and I know so well, I go through the same stuff as everybody else, but like yeah. realize that discomfort is the price of admission for a meaningful life on the other side of your ability to be emotionally uncomfortable with yourself and face some of these demons you have is an amazing life. And I'm really grateful that I've made some progress there where I'm genuinely happy with some of the stuff that I'm doing. And I know like Nick and other people have been there. We want that for everybody. We want that for the coaches, the athletes, the parents. We want that for the sport as a holistic, you know, overall. So like, we're trying to help you. <laughs> it's just like coaching. Happy gymnasts can do that too. Like if they advocate their happy coach, you, do you know what I mean? Where they've had it, you're talking about, so say, you know, going back to the elite end where you've got coaches that maybe are struggling a bit because actually they don't, they're at the top of their game. So they don't have anywhere else to go. Right. And, you know, where the pride gets in the way and they can't ask or whatever. If you've got other coaches that they can say, you know, I I know that the last gym that I, um, that I was a gymnast at, um, I am so they're still going strong now and they are incredible. Do you know what I mean? They are the most amazing people. And I, they, they do, they've produced a, you know, girl that, you know, sort of the Kelly Sim in the UK, they're her coaches and she's, they, De, De, um, it's Debbie and Keith Hampton, they, um, Debbie and Keith Richardson, they're, they're phenomenal. And, but they loved me through my teens when I was an absolute toad. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of that bit that you kind of remember. How's it self worth? You're not a dude. They're a good coach here. You know, yeah. that's why they're good. Okay. I, you know, I haven't seen them for a number of years now, but their positive influence has stayed with me forever. And if there's coaches out there that are not quite getting it, I'd say, do you know what? I know someone who's kind of really open and doing a great, you know, they do an amazing job. So go talk to them because they're on the same level as you. Yeah. You know, you don't always want to be told by someone who's 
perceived as being as a lo at a lower level than you but if you're with someone who's your equal you're more like maybe more likely to listen i don't know yeah. but that could you know it's almost having it's making sure that that top end have a really strong network to deal with the demons that maybe you know when they start questioning whether they've done okay or not or whether something hasn't quite gone right they can then question it in a safe environment in a safe space yep. um, you yep. know so they can make change happen yeah, there's there's so many good people in the world that are doing it well. And I have so many examples, like Nick Ruddick, right? Like Eric Vandermeer has been on our podcast. I'm just talking about people in the States. Justin Ziegler, like really great coaches who are doing high-level things, right? There's uh, elite coaches that I know, like, um, like Tammy and um, Sarin Salciano, who just are incredible, positive, shining lights that taught me a lot about giving hope. But like there's people out there that are doing the right thing. And I think this is where my next conversation comes, and we'll, we'll wrap it up after these kind of things. But like I think that people, like you said, surround choose to surround yourself with people who give you honest feedback, but in a, in a position of love, right? You know, in a position of, of I want to help you be better. And I have a network of like five to 10 friends who I listen to everything they say. I actively think about it, you know, and I, and I value their opinion. So find people who are going to give you honest feedback, but in a position of, of I love you and I want to help you. So that's important for everyone to do that. But kind of on the, the last point, which I think is really important is how do we, how should people handle interaction and conflict? I, I, I want to call it, it's not calling people out. It's not holding, I mean, hold, NGBs have a role to clearly create channels where if someone is doing something inappropriate, they should be reported and the NGB has to, in a duality, hold the person accountable and actually take action for change down the road and safeguard that system to not make it a witch hunt. And I think that's a really important yeah. caveat. Yeah. We don't want this to turn into a, a, a crazy parent or someone who has a qualm or something like that who is who is calling people out and accusing them of things that could possibly ruin their life without yeah. real evidence and real things. So I, I know I don't want to, I don't want to say it's so rare that that happens with witch hunting, but like it should be a clear channel where you can report. It can happen. Right. It's bear about whatever. Children are, you know, we're all very passionate about our children. So you can't, no. be, maliciously. You can't be used for, for evil. You know what I mean? And I think yeah. that's a rare minority, but it's a, it's a concern of many coaches is that they they can't do anything because they're worried about a crazy parent or, you know, an ex gymnast who is a bitter about something is going to speak up. That never happens. And I never, I want to be really careful that I'm never, encouraging someone not to speak up because I believe and think reporting is super important. That's, like the, that's the NGB's role is to create those systems. But I really think that all of us have a responsibility within our peer groups to hold each other accountable. And I have two or three coaches I work with that when I do something stupid, they tell me and I'm like, oh yeah, my fault. So how do we, my long winded explanation, how do we foster healthy uh, communication and productive disagreement from coach to coach, parent to parent, parent to coach, gymnast to gymnast? How do we create channels and environments where people feel as though they can speak up and talk about people's behavior and how to change that? And what what's the tactical? How do you approach a conversation like that? I think if you if you approach it in a defensive way or in like on the attack, um, then people tend to just go back in the shell and they stay there. You know, they're not going to, and then you end up with a real conflict. Again, I think it's down to the way that you speak to that person. So for example, if we're talking about something that was going on in the gym and there was an interaction between a gymnast and a coach, and I could see immediately that that coach is getting particularly stressed, that gymnast is getting particularly upset and it's not okay, then I would make an excuse for that gymnast to leave. So ultimately you are you are putting that gymnast in a safe place in the first place. Mm. I would never ball out another coach in front of another co in front of anybody. Okay, yep. that is an absolute big no no because you don't. Why would you do that to somebody? You know, you don't know what happened for them to get there in the first place. So actually, you go. I think you need a cup of tea, or you know, go and take mm -hmm. it. Or you know, that's so typically British, isn't it? A cup of tea. But <laughs> <laughs> I heard that come out of my mouth. <laughs> but um, you know, go and get you know, get yourself a drink of water. I'll deal with her when she comes back, it's fine. So actually what you're doing is you're dealing with that in a supportive way mm. rather than in a in a negative, you don't do ever, do you know what I mean? You can't, I don't think that's necessarily the way to go ahead. So effectively you are safeguarding that child, that gymnast first, then it's actually, maybe we need to have a conversation about this later. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And actually you have a time where you can sit down properly and say, what happened? You know, what happened there? 
Um, and then you're actually getting there. Well, she said this and this happened and that happened and that's the other. And then you can actually say so that can whether that's you as a coach or whether you pass that on to, you know, if you feel like you can't do that, you can pass that on to your supervisor or your person that's in charge. Um, your welfare officer, if you have one in the gym, that's another one that you could go to. So effectively, you you use the channels that you've got to deal with that, but you don't just let it go. The worst thing you can do is just turn a blind eye. Mm. So then once you've, you know, you've dealt with the immediate incident, for example, you sit, you can work with that person, meet at a separate time, or you go and say, I'm going to have to tell someone, you know, and B, I think it's just being open. It's that open and honesty and transparency that again, it's, it's about listening to understand. I heard that term the other day and I thought, God, that's so good. Actually listen to what's happening. Listen to what's happening with that person that's done that. Listen to the person that it's been done to. So you're actually getting a very balanced view of what's going on first. Then you can start restoring if it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate and it was something that was completely wrong, then you're obviously going to take a different course of action. But each gym should have its own policy into what to do. So there is a clear idea of what to do, not just what to do as a person, but actually what to do as a coach, as a professional in that gym. So safeguard the child first. Then it's actually we need to have a follow up conversation. Then, you know, it's a case of putting in measures to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So you're saying, right, you are in this position. So what could we do in the future? So if you find yourself in that position again, feeling that way, what can you do to make sure that you don't give that response again? So I'm yeah. talking about someone's like bawling somebody out or having a go at somebody or something yeah. or not being particularly pleasant. Yeah. So, you know, then you can say, right, okay, so first lady, I can feel my feeling. I know how I felt when I felt like that. Right, okay. So when you feel like that, what's the best thing to do? If it's that particular gymnast that is personality clash that happens, you can actually create space and create distance yeah. right i'd really like you to go and work on x over there with that coach so then you've got a support network for that particular coach who's dealing with something difficult so rather than putting them in an environment where they're not being supported where they're just being chastised that's not good for anybody you want to promote change so actually you need to get them in a supportive environment that's going to work but by doing that as well you need to be transparent mm. and that, that open that openness and that honesty um, is really key and I think it's if you're going to report it like as in if it was a really serious incident you need to make sure that it's logged yeah, yeah. so whatever has happened there is a note and that there has been a conversation about it and that there is because then if there's any follow-up later on you can backtrack so say for example it happens again the following week and you're like you know we know that this happened we had a conversation about this then you're having to take another form of action because clearly that person either needs upskilling or maybe this isn't the job for them yeah, yeah. so I think that's where we need to kind of look to go that there are one yes there are clear things to do but as a coach as say for example you're the youngest coach at the bottom of the pile always safeguard that child first yep. then whether it's you having the conversation or whether as a young you know sort of I'm saying young early career coach you go and speak to your boss and say I witnessed this but they should have a way of being able to log it and report it as well so that it's it's on a system somewhere yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think the really important point you said there is like, you know, and I'll kind of share our pathway that we do it is, you know, pending an immediate safety concern or something that's clearly inappropriate. Like you, the first thing you should do is act and take care of that. Right. But pending is not something immediately dangerous is in the moment. Don't let your emotion grab hold of you and blow up. Right. I think that's really important. I think nobody likes to be called out in front of other people. There's really not a lot of reasons to yell in a gym, to be honest. Not really. You know, clear safety. So a little kid runs out in the vault runway. You're like, yeah, ah, stop. <laughs> um, like, there's really never a time to yell. There's really not. And if you're if you're resorting to yelling all the time, then like you have some serious soul searching to do. But along with that is like something that always Eva, my boss, who's been on the podcast, she's incredible. I wouldn't have all the success that I have without her. But she always, I know she does it so well. She always is like private conversation. Pull them aside. Difference is like, hey, are you okay? Like, is everyone yeah. right here? Because this, this is not you. This is not, this is not who I know. This is not who I hired. This is not the person. And like, kind of, again, it's, it's a tactical way to open that conversation towards a defensive, not a defensive, but more of an open passive. I care about you. I want to help you. So having right. that, and then you have to really make sure that you're looking at the facts, not the assumptions or the opinions about what happened, like with two people or with you and somebody else, like, here are the facts. This is what was said. 
this was not the thing that we're worried about. The action, the behavior is what we're worried about. And you have to always compare that against your moral code, your ethical code, your employee handbook, your guidelines, right? What's the standard of ethics you're comparing that against? If you have all these things in a handbook and it lives in a drawer in your desk and nobody knows about it, that's not going to happen. But you compare the action or the behavior that you saw compared to what's standard and what should be upheld that's where you can kind of give somebody a constructive criticism without like a, don't attack them as a human but you go through that process of like here's what happened this is the fact not the assumptions this is what didn't go well right and then from there you write and you plan for change and then you have follow-up you like okay here's what we're gonna do here okay we admit it we're sorry this is wrong apologize whatever blah 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 talk to the parent settle the difference and then like here's the error we found this is my mistake this is your mistake Here's what we're going to do to change it. And then the next week, written in stone, you know, like this is what we're doing. Did we do it? It's having that clear plan yeah. and clear. It's having those coping mechanisms because actually, usually when they have an emotional response to something I'm talking about, if someone shouted at somebody or they're getting frustrated, that frustration in their coaching is actually, it's an emotional response. It's not objective. And I think actually those standards need to be up on the wall in the gym. The kids can see the standards. The coaches can see the standards. There's no arguing against the standards because they're right there and they're right there in front of them and it's actually it's making sure that everybody has a clear I want to say exit route but mm -hmm. I don't mean exiting the gym I just mean figuratively speaking that they've got a way to diffuse a situation before it gets too much and if it's a case of a gymnast that so you know if it's more I'm going to talk, you know, sort of you look at the athlete A situation and um, Larry Nassar and all of that hideous, that hideous situation. There were things that were, uh, you know, it wasn't reported. It wasn't moved on. You know, gymnasts didn't report. Or they talked amongst themselves. You know, it didn't. It or wasn't ignored. Up. Yeah, it was just ignored. And money and where, sponsorships. Yeah, that crap. Yeah. And that's where things that you've just that can't ever ever happen again those children need to know that their bodies are their own and that's you know on that the gymnast needs to have a safe space where they can talk where if something doesn't feel right and again it comes down to that empowerment if something doesn't feel right it's not simple as you know it might be that it's not right because i feel too scared it's not right because that person makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, so you're looking at two different things there. It might be gymnastics related, but it might actually be a grooming situation. And if that, that's there, then it's not right. And it's looking at those interactions and questioning them, calling them out, because it's a lot harder for a potential perpetrator of abuse to do it if they're called out. Mm. What I mean so and again yes private yeah it is a it's not a conversation in front of those children but ultimately or in front of other coaches necessarily but it's still the conversation that needs to happen because they are less likely to pursue if they think that somebody's on their case yeah. and I think that we just you know we are all guilty if we don't do anything about it so if you sit there and something doesn't feel right and you don't do anything about it then you're just as guilty as the person who did L because, looking away is also a choice yeah it is a choice you know you you have got choice and if it doesn't feel right then you always tell somebody you d tell the appropriate person you know it doesn't have to be a full-on report if you're not 100 percent sure it's just a case of this doesn't sit right with me can you just look at it for me yeah. you know sometimes it's that second pair of eyes you know um and it, if someone else is saying the same thing as you chances are then there's something not right and it needs sorting out yeah and, and you said something that i have to expand and talk about the the coping mechanism situation i think that's this is tying to this conversation is like that's a really good way to to start to kind of raise your eyebrows if something is healthy or not healthy in terms of like is this, a, is this unsafe or abusive and also personally for yourself is in my mind i see there's coping mechanisms right there's like the tactical professional coping like thing like okay if someone's not getting a skill do you, are you doing things well do you have the resources that you need do you know how to teach this skill well do you know how to write a strength program do you know how to get somebody ready for a meet and deal with that right there's like the if you lack education and you, yeah. you don't feel like you're in, you're um, you're knowledgeable enough and you have the things you need to be successful, you get frustrated and you and you do things, you do things, crazy things. You you go crazy hours, you push the volume, you push the intensity and you're like, just go, 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 go. Like, do you have the skills you need to cope on a professional level? But that's not really what I'm thinking about. More is like on a personal level, do you have the skills to cope in a healthy way with stress and with discomfort and emotional problems and conflict, right? And 
I'm thinking back to like when I was a younger coach and things like, do you go to like, are your coping mechanisms for your stress in the gym and your personal life, food and social media and booze yeah. and, and just escaping and numbing yourself and running away from the, all the, all the problems in your life? Or do you use those things as a healthy way to maybe once in a while recover yourself? Do you love a TV show? And you're, that's a healthy relationship with that yeah. medium, right? You can do social media. You can have junk food. I love it. Right. But like, there's a difference between a choice to have it as part of your recovery and depending on it for advice to numb yourself and escape your problems, right? Or do you have healthy coping mechanisms in place? Do you have social support? I, I went to a, a therapist when I first started having issues and like just having someone to vent to that was not involved in gymnastics at all. Doesn't was, it make a difference? Nothing. Yeah. Gymnastics, nothing. But just having a neutral party, right? I have friends around me who I can go to and talk to. I know like exercise and sleep and eating well and, and having outlets for my stress and journaling and books are really restorative to me. And I think people really need to look hard about like what are their relationships with their things? Are they vice based or are they virtue based? If they're vice based and you're addicted to that thing because it numbs the world and you just like, I think a common one I think about is like when you, you start to approach a discomfort conversation with like a gym or stuff and you just like turn away and you just like gossip with another coach or you like you pop your phone out and you're on your phone, right? Like, well, you you're dancing with discomfort and you're 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 looking away. Distraction. It's distraction. So you don't have to deal with the actual stress itself. Yeah. yeah. So make a list. I, I, I encourage people to make a list of the things that they do for fun or maybe they do and say, is this a vice or is this a virtue? Is this like, I love this TV show and I do it once a week or twice a week because I love it? Or do I watch four hours of TV because I'm, I'm miserable at my work and with my life choices and I want to be better? Am I just eating a bag of you know chips because I want to just have some sort of you know positive uh, pleasure? That's not joy, right? That's pleasure. That's and not joy. And it's making it's making sure that people feel like whether it's gymnasts or just people in general, um, it's actually making them realize that in terms of their belief system as well, that they they are valued enough that they can be joyful and it's OK to be joyful. And I think anyone that's suffered, I'm going to say suffered or dealt with or had to come to terms with anything adverse. So I was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder about four years ago. Mm. And um, so I had to learn to manage that. I am very strong willed. So spent quite a number of years denying that. Um, but then once I got to a point where I actually had to do something about it, because all my um, coping mechanisms were unhealthy, I just worked harder. You know, that was my coping mechanism. So yeah. I would work more and more and more and do more. And that's not you know that's not a healthy way yeah. so um yeah i think you do you you have to go is that is this good for me i'm worthy i can smile it's okay to smile it's okay to be mm. happy it's okay to enjoy my life you know we've only got one so you know you've got to make the most of it. no one makes it out alive anyways <laughs> no but I'll, I'll go kicking and screaming <laughs> that's it, that's it. um so, yeah Sorry. Um, I, I think it's, it's just so important. This conversation, I could talk to you for four more hours, man. This is, amazing. I, know, right? <laughs> I also think that the, the coping that you coming to terms with your coping skills and your management stuff is a positive role model for the athletes in terms yeah. of how you know these well, when, when other athletes or other coaches see you not blowing up and handling professional conflict or accepting criticism, well, it does way more for them in terms of behavior change than having a lecture about what, you know, all that kind of stuff or having a PR meeting about this is how we handle conflict. And I'm all like leading by example is really important. Like if you don't have a stage, you have yeah, just two hours. So if um, PE, in, for, so for physical education, physical education lessons in the UK tend to be two hours long. So in a whole time that a child is watching their teacher, it's something like 15,000 15, hours they watch their teacher. Mm. So if you think how many hours are they watching their coaches? All right. So if you've got a gymnast that's in there 25 hours a week, 20 hours a week, 10 hours a week, that's a lot more than two hours a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. So therefore, they are spending a lot of time and those socialized behaviors are becoming part of their belief system, which, again, is why it's so important that they don't see us blow up left, right and center, that we accept when we get it wrong. And that actually, I'm really sorry I shouted. I shouldn't have done that. You know, but I did feel really cross and I just need to acknowledge that. And sometimes it is acknowledging that we're human and that sometimes we get it wrong. But noticing that and saying yeah that was wrong I shouldn't have I shouldn't have dealt with it that way yeah. and I think your kids are going to have a lot more respect that if we do get it wrong because we are human that we actually say I'm so sorry you know we do we go in with the best intention and sometimes people do get it wrong and for whatever reason 
So actually, and I'm not talking about wrong, wrong, as in power trip and all that kind of yeah. stuff. I'm talking about your general came in, had a bad day and had a little bit of a moan at somebody. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of thing. You go, I'm really sorry that I spoke to you that way. OK. And then they'll go on. Oh, oh, that's OK. But they recognize that you recognize that you got it wrong. So, you know, again, about that behaving, ch you know, sort of creating change. We are now what's going on in the gym is going to educate and inform that the future generations of coaches which is why it's so important that that socialized shift the norms and values that we have in the gym start shifting now so we are showing more and more good practice and actually recognizing and saying i'm really sorry i shouldn't have done that or i shouldn't have said that because then you're actually acknowledging that something didn't go quite right absolutely yeah i think what you said is so important related to they often spend more time with you or equal time with you as they do their parents. And so you are a massive influence on their belief systems and what they feel uh, the, the pass down of values and the pass down of what's right and wrong and ethics very much comes through the role modeling of this. And there's a lot of research on this in terms of like pass down. So like you have a huge responsibility as uh, obviously if you're a parent, but as a coach, as someone like if you're a medical provider who works with these athletes, like you have a massive responsibility to help form good humans with a set of ethics and morals that they believe in all these things we've talked about the internal you know self-belief and that their worth and things of that nature come from their work ethic and that their values are but like also like if you act in a way that's respectable and professional and stuff like that you're going to teach them to do that themselves and if they're seeing you do have your vices or act inappropriately or yell at a competition or push kids through injuries like what do you think that's doing for shaping their belief system when they grow up? I think it's normal. And it's those normalized, it's that normalized socialization. It's that socialization process that is so important. Yes, psychology is important. The physical is important. But actually, in terms of the sociological aspect of it, those are going to be the, that's going to be the big drive forwards, I think, in terms of promoting that change, because everything we do from the second we step into the gym is going to have influence on what happens moving forwards, not just for the gymnasts now, but how those gymnasts are going to behave when a lot of them we actually recruit from within, you know, a lot of ex gymnasts will become coaches. Yeah. So we're not recruiting from outside. It's very rare that you'll get a coach, a gymnastics coach, unless maybe they're a parent. I don't know. Um, but they very rarely come into teaching gymnastics or coaching gymnastics from the outside. So they're already in, you know, they're already in that little gymnastics field or that bubble. So we need to make sure that the practices within that bubble are absolutely solid so that when they become part of their habitus, part of the things that they do, their blindly actioning functions of self-control, they're going to do them. Um, they're going to do the right ones and the right one, for the next generation of gymnasts. And, you know, th there's no harm in you know there are changes that need to be made in terms of how we view gymnasts you know mm -hmm. what does a gymnast look like you know what does an elite gymnast look like they're already changing you know you look after sort of in the 90s when they were sort of this big to now they're starting to get they're starting to look a bit more like women and a lot of that is down to diet and nutrition because people are quickly realizing that you know our gymnasts do need to be a lot healthier but some of them are still getting flack for being a little bit you know by not being that particular size or shape yeah. that's in the mind's view. So we need to change that mind's view as well, you know? So that, that, that needs to change. We could go on for hours. This is amazing, yeah. And unfortunately, we both have a job to get to, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle, this was incredible. And I thank you so much. And I just want to give you the last end of the podcast platform. Is there anything that we didn't touch on or that you have going that you want to talk about that you think is really important before we kind of sign off? Um, I think we've said everything, to be honest. But if I could, if there's any take home, I think it's just, you know, if it believe in your heart of hearts and you're passionate and you love your gymnastics and you love, it's a beautiful, beautiful sport. So we need to make sure that that environment is the most beautiful environment for children to grow up in because they are, they're spending too many hours with us not to enjoy it. So, you know, let's make them the best people that they can be, not damaged little people that you know that have so many issues when they grow up let's make them let let gymnastics make them not actually break them i think is the take home super well said i couldn't agree more all right where can people find you in terms of like your you know social media or i think you're on twitter now you're cruising the twitter world i am yeah i'm quite new to twitter so i'm quite the tweets down. Podcast, I run out. I talk. I talk like I write like a talk. So yeah. there's not enough. <laughs> there's not enough characters. I know. Two eighty is not enough. You need a blog. You need a blog. That's what you need. 
I do, yeah. I do need a blog, but they'd probably be about 30 pages long, you know. Yeah. <laughs> also join our, we have an online community we just started that we would love to have you as part of. So you should definitely join that. You'd have great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. So it's um, at um, Michelle Flemons um, or Flemons Michelle at Flemons Michelle. Yep. Um, and it comes up as like Dr. Michelle Flemons. Um, so because that's part of me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exciting um i haven't quite got that one down yet i'm not i'm still not cool with that you know you know like some people are just like yeah i'm so good but i'm I'm not yet Um, you've worked hard for it you You should yeah yeah too right Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's a lot of hours long hours Um, but yeah and um what else have i got just that at the moment i'm just on twitter on linkedin as well so um again it's just dr flemons on um linkedin um and it's michelle flemons at aol.com um i'm affiliated with the with university of bedfordshire at the moment um but that's subject to change i'm just i'm researching with them at the moment which is really nice um but ultimately yeah i'm yeah just get in touch if you have any questions (laughs) that sounds great i'm sure you'll have more than you think (laughs) (laughs) Uh, <laughs> That'd be nice. I had so much fun talking. I learned so much and I look forward to our future conversations. Yeah, I hope so. That's lovely. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate yeah. it. No All problem. right. Take care.